Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today it will be the promised video about my common variable immunodeficiency, um, what it is, how it affects me and the treatments I go through for, with it, but also how often I have to do them and I'm also going to show you how I do them. So tonight you'll find out all about it. It's quite a rare condition, so as I'm talking through I'll give you a few bits of statistics about it as well. So the first stage is preparing the infusion. So bear with me, I need to go set up my hand washing set area because this does take a lot of extremely good clinical level hand washing because I'll be using needles, bandages and I will technically have open wounds as I'm doing it but like I said I will explain everything as I go along. So here we go, Friday night is infusion night. Yay, fun. And here we go, part one, like I said, is the hand washing method that I use. I've already pre-cleaned and bleached the kitchen surface I'm going to be using. So the next bit is the hand washing that I do. Now, please excuse the bathroom, but there'll be a bit of toing and froing now as I show you what I'm going to be doing. Now the next bit, as you can see, I have my lovely infusion box. As you can see, I have my lovely infusion box. Now I'll take you through what I keep inside this, as this is the this is the storage box that I use to carry my infusion supplies when I go abroad, because I have to take it with me, and exactly what it entails and what is in there. So let's get the kit out, and then you can have a look inside. I will mention this box is lockable. And I do have the keys for it, so when I'm travelling, I do lock the box, just in case. When you open it up, this is how it looks. A bit of a mess, but I'll now talk you through everything that's in it. Start off with my handy tray. Just the right size to be able to put my needles and things on, as you will see. Cotton wool balls for afterwards antibacterial hand gel, big pot as I use a lot of it, transport tape to be able to attach the needles and secure them in. As you can see it is transport. This is because I'm actually allergic to micropore. It brings me out in a rather large rash. One thing I put on about an hour before I infuse is this Emla cream. You want to get it in tiny, tiny packets but this will help numb the area, so if you do find it painful when you have the needles to insert them, like I do, this is a lifesaver. Now this is made up of lidocaine and prilocaine, so, and it really does work. I'll show you short, and then, then you get into the actual bag of goodies. Now I always put them, as soon as I get my supplies, I sort them out into these bags. They come provided with the Ziploc bags. So I just sort it out into what I need for each week. Then all I have to do is just replace the bag. Essentials also. Pen. And infusion diary. So here you have the date it was done who it's administered by, which is me, am I ill, the barcodes which I will show you where I get those from, how long it's taken, time, start and finish times, any other medications, pre and few medicine medications, adverse reactions or effects and of course a good signature, my name, how much I infuse which is 6 grams, date of birth, the product which is Hyzentra and the Frequency is weekly, subcutaneous, so I have to do this every week. And an extra bit that I've added is this part at the side here that says whereabouts I've done it. So RT is right thigh, LT is obviously left thigh. Then I've got central, mid and edge of stomach. So I do five different sites and they alternate each week. And then for my documentation in here, I've got letters from the hospital that says why I'm carrying it, what it is, good old prescription, 
with just my basic medications on, which I also keep in here while I'm travelling. Um, again, letters, spare infusion diaries, um, the actual paperwork that came with the infusions and the latest one of each of the delivery reports as well. I also keep my masks as I showed you in Illnesses and Me video and the spare inserts to make them filtered. I also carry emergency antihistamines that I can take on top of my current ones that I normally take and I normally have I always carry the emblem cream and the keys for the box as well are always stored in it so I've got everything I need when I need it. Now the next bit we're going to go on to is exactly what is in this wonderful bag of tricks. So let's unpack it and then you can see exactly what goes in my infusions. Right now here we go with unpacking the equipment. Now I'm going to go repeat my hand washing now I've taken it all out of the box, I like to repeat my hand washing just to be safe. So I shall be back in a moment after I've rewashed my hands. I won't show this again, so I'm going to do it three or four times during this process. So if you see me just bobbing off camera for a moment, it's because I'm going to do, wash my hands. So I'll just open the bag and then go wash my hands. I always take it out of the non-sterile bag so that my hands are all sterilised when it comes to actually using and opening the equipment because it has to be in a sterile environment hence why I do such a long process with my hand washing. Now the first thing I unpack is the dressing towel. Now the most important thing is to make sure that the dates are in date. This one is, it's got a rip. These, all this equipment does generally have a quite a long date on it. But sometimes with the actual immunoglobulins, which I'll show you shortly, um, it's slightly different and you do have to be really careful with them. Now the aim of this is to try and touch it as little as possible while you're opening it. I like to fold it in half and then that just fits nicely across my infusion tray. Now that doesn't move. So the next thing I'll unpack are my needles. I will make you aware there is medical equipment involved in this, so if you do not like needles, I suggest you look away while I'm unpacking this part. Now these are um, Microlance 3s. They, these I use to get the medication out of the files, and they are always attached to these plastic 10 mil syringes so I'll just open those up and bob them down and then now I'll attach the needles to the syringes and pull 5 mils of air so that's what that bit looks like and now I shall repeat the process they're just a quick and simple twist on twist off so it's really easy to change to the next need, set of needles when I need to do. So now again pull in 5 mils of air. Next I always unpack the butterfly needles. Now these are the ones that I use for the actual infusion itself. Take those off, take off the plastic cover but always leave the stopper on. So I'll do the other one of those. And pop those to the side as well. Now the next bit is I need to get one of my sterile wipes because as you'll see in a moment, I have to use this on my actual bottle of immunoglobulins. Now I do take 6 grams of this, so that's equivalent to 30 mils. So I do 15 in each site, and I do two sites. So what you need to do is check the bottle to make sure there's nothing floating in it, that it's clear colour. Then take the label off here with the barcode on. This is what you stick on your infusion diary. So you just bob that over in one corner. That is the smaller vial which is the one I will take through with me and then as you can see you just stick the little sticker rub onto your paperwork so you've got a record and then you do the same with your 4 mil bo bottle which as you can see is double the size well, it's just over double they always put extra amounts in 
and then again you take the barcode off put it to one side and attach that to the paperwork so it looks like that now next because I'll be putting this one in the syringes first you always double check that the batch number here matches with the batch number on the box which is always located on the top with the expiry date if it's expired you do not use it under any circumstances it gets wasted and then reported to the company just making sure mine matches yes it does so that can be popped to one side and then you do the same with the small bottle and exactly the same way you check the barcode on the side against the barcode on the top and again they are the same so we can carry on now I always do the packaging to one side until I'm finished just in case something goes wrong touch wood fingers crossed and all that it hasn't so far so we'll go from there right the next bit is to take this red stopper off the top and draw out the first 10 mils of liquid really easy to pop and then just bob that to one side. With the needles, you just pull this protective cover off, be extremely careful. And then again, do not watch this bit if you do not like seeing needles, as you will see a lot of it now. So next, you put it into the file, pump in the air, turn it over, and then pull the liquid out. Always keeping the needle as close to the bottom of the file as possible, making sure the air bubbles go back in. And then you just follow that, carry on going, to get just over the 10 mil mark, bring it back in until you get there, turn the bottle over, take it out, cover the needle straight back up, it just clicks into place, then leave that to settle, undo your sterile strip, out of the packaging, bob that to one side, take the bottle and rub it on the top of the bottle to re-sterilise it and do this for about 10 seconds. Keep going round and round, making sure that every part of that stopper is very well sterilised because you're going to reinsert the other needle into the same stopper to get out the rest of the liquid. There we go. Then you bob that with the rest of the packaging to one side and then just simply Uncap the needle and repeat the process. Squeeze in the air, pull out the liquid. This one you will always get more air bubbles in, so don't worry, it's quite normal. Move the needle to as close to the bottom as you can, so you have as little air flowing into the syringe as possible. Sometimes you do get a fairly hefty bubble. Normally the pressure fills the syringe straight back up with the liquids. Today it is not, so you just push the air bubble back through and carry on. Moving the liquid, to, taking care that it doesn't touch the side of the bottle. If possible, just keep moving it further and further down. And then you get one empty bottle. Bob that to one side as that goes into the sharps bin later. Again, always reseal the needle, then let it settle. Now while those are settling, you prepare your little table and you take your kit through that you need to move before your hands have to be re-sterilised. So for example, the cotton wool balls, the alcohol gel and the transport because you will need them wherever you're taking the infusions. You can't fit them on my tray, so I shall go take them through to my infusion destination, which today is my bedroom. But I'll take you through when I finish prepping all of this. And now these are settled, you turn them one side up, gently flick the syringe, make sure there's no air bubbles in there, and then this is when you take the popper off the end. You take the needle off, and again these are just twist on, twist it on like so, and then we need to do what we call priming the tubing, which is where you squeeze the immunoglobulins straight into the tubing. You slowly do that until you see it just popping out of the end 
at the cylinder. Don't know if you can see that, but that's what it should look like. I normally only attach one of these tubings and I'll attach the other one later on when I've refilled it out of this syringe. So again, bob that to one side. Now this has settled a bit. You again do the flicking. Make sure you get as many of those air bubbles out as possible. Well, I, what most people do is squeeze it out through the needle. But what I prefer to do is to open it up. Squeeze out the air. As you can see, so it forms bubbles. You are not wasting any of the immunoglobulins here. It is absolutely marginal what you are losing as the bubbles pop. As you can see, it goes up. And then you get a few ones in. That's the point where I normally bob that straight back on. And again, leave it to settle for a bit longer. Also adding on two plasters, two more sterile strips, which you'll need to prime the actual infusion sites. And then your paperwork. So you just fill it in. Like I said, I show, I write down exactly where I pop things. So I'll just quickly fill that in now. So right thigh, the date today, my name. If anyone else helps me, I always bob their name in as well. Just so you can keep a track. Now as I'm still recovering from being sick and have a cough, I'm writing down that I've still got a possibility of being sick while I'm doing this one. So start time. Finish time, no pre-meds, no other meds, and then you sign off and you write the adverse reactions at the end. Don't sign it off early. So let's just say it'll start in about 10 minutes. So we'll write that down. And then as soon as you finish, you come back and you write the rest of it out. So let's go into my infusion area. Now this will be my infusion area for tonight. I'm already pretty tired so I figure if I'm too tired after I finish everything I can just flop into bed and I'm done. And then I'll just make a note of what time I've finished and then fill it up the rest in that's in the kitchen tomorrow. Normally I don't do that but as I'm really really extra tired tonight this is what it's going to be. So, but first, hand washing again. Now like I said I do two different areas for my fusion, my stomach and my thigh. Tonight just happens to be a thigh night, so please excuse the naked thigh action here. I do have to have one of my sights rather high, so you will be seeing a fair bit of leg in this part of the infusion, just while I'm showing you how exactly I put the needles in and how I prepare the area. So, it's getting a bit late now, so before I get too tired, let's start with the leg infusion. So the first thing I need to do is prepare the top area and get in a comfortable position because once this thigh infusion starts, I'm not in any way able to move from where I am. So, yeah, let's go. Okay, so now it's time to actually prepare the sites. What I do now is remove the dressing I've used. In my case, I can't use the regular dressings. So I use cling film. I literally wrap it around my leg and that's how, what I use to seal in the Emla cream and it does just as good a job but it does mean your thigh is entirely covered in cling film. And also you can see here we have the Emla cream spot. This generally, although you will remove it, does leave a mark while you're actually um, cleaning it off. It does leave a red mark so you're able to see exactly where you've infused and safety first like I said I'm very tired I might not go back into the kitchen to write it all down so I've brought my paperwork and my sharp spin in with me so I can just bob everything straight in there as and when I need to so here we go with the infusing so the first thing I need to do is remove the cling film from the top site the first one where I'm going to do it You can see you can see the Emla cream just on the top there. So now I'm going to use one of the Steri wipes. And fair warning, people, I am going to show the insertion of a needle into my thigh next. So if you do have a phobia of needles, please please feel free to fast forward this particular part until I can cover it up and explain what happens next. So for those who are going to watch me. 
excuse the camera wobbling I've got it balanced in a very precarious position so you really well dry it on there and then because you've touched your clothing and the cling film a fair amount of alcohol gel and just rub that all over your hands now as I said earlier you can see here there is a red patch where the emla cream has been so you're pretty much guaranteed to be able to know exactly where you're infusing into so now I apologize you're getting a big close-up of thigh now it's just so I can be really accurate and show you from above exactly what's going to happen and before you insert your needles always prepare your lengths of transport what I do normally is attach them to the top of the alcohol hand gel and just bob that next to me so it's easy to access you need one long bit and one short ish but you'll see the lengths when I actually place them in building needles so hand gel is on primed next you take your needle with the butterfly needle on that you had earlier now on the butterfly needle there is a side which is slightly dotted don't know if you can see there you can see on the actual needle itself that there's a dotted edge that's what you use to grip with one hand you fold it up because if you do it this way the needle is pointing down and it makes for a much smoother insertion if you point it the up other way it's extremely painful and you do not want to do that under any circumstances without any further ado you remove this plastic cap from the needle relax your thigh you pinch an inch angle a needle at 45 degrees and insert this is where you put on your long piece of tape some people may do this differently I will explain the system once I've secured everything in not the smoothest application of tape ever so when you put on that first one you take your syringe and you pull back slightly so as you can see you're on that part zoom out slightly so you can see some bubbles coming into the air tube and then you'll know if you've done it right because you won't see any blood pulling back into the needle so now you know that you've not got anything there you make a little loop of your tubing like so then you attach it with the second piece the smaller piece tegaderm in the opposite direction I find it easier to do it that way then it all is a lot easier to take off afterwards and now you're ready to infuse so as you do that all you do now this is the manual push system so you manually push the liquid into your thigh bit by bit or stomach or wherever you choose to infuse as long as there's somewhere where it is um, got a bit of a fatty area under the skin because that's where you inject it in which I shall explain now so now I'll talk a bit about CVID okay now I'm actually infusing this can take anywhere up to from 50 minutes to two hours depending on whether I'm coming into being ill going out of being ill or whether it's just a really bad day and I have to run it slowly today shouldn't be too bad so we'll see how long it takes so I normally put it in a tenth of a mil at a time so 0.1 mils because it's easier for me to track how, I've, how much I'm doing because I do as you will see swap needles syringes part way through on the same needle so I have to because I have to refill one of the syringes but I will show you that process as I'm doing it so for the first 10 mils it's pretty straightforward you stick the needle in and you push the liquid in as well so I keep saying CVID that is common variable immunodeficiency it's a very rare disease like I said I believe it's only one in 25,000 people that have it so in the equivalent of the UK the equivalent number is about the population of Clapham in London and everyone knows how busy London is and how small an area that is so you can imagine that there's quite a fair few people who will not even know this disease exists now what common variable immunodeficiency is is where the white blood cells are not produced anymore by the body 
some people have this from birth some people it's brought on but there's no way of testing when you got it whether it's genetic or not you just find out as and when you're diagnosed mine was found after a long process which i shall go into a little bit more in a moment through various blood tests through a certain allergy and immunology clinic who are by far the best team i have come across and believe me i have been involved in a lot of medical care teams for myself so yeah like i said if you go to watch my illness and my illnesses and me video which i'll link below that explains the rest of what's going on as well you'll have to excuse me if i keep looking down when i'm doing that it's because i'm pushing another mill another part of a mill into my leg so like i said i will keep looking down because i need to gauge how much i'm pushing in at a time now the way that it was found that i had this common this cvid deficiency was because i'd been getting lots of chest infections and I lost a lot of weight. This was while I was at university, so I was between 18 and a year after, so between 18 and 22. I got diagnosed with this February of 2012, now five years ago, this month. So that's a scary thought. I've been doing these, these infusions for five years now. Very scary thought, but so glad that I did. Now, We've no idea how mine started, but I believe it could be due to the surgery that I had four days after my 18th birthday. And it was a bimaxillofacial surgery where they basically broke both my jaws, rechanged the shape of my nose, and built me a chin. I'll insert a couple of before and after photos just so you can see the difference. But it was quite long surgery. I was borderline needing a transfusion. I'd always had issues before that. For example, I never became immune to rubella no matter how many immunizations I had. Even though I had had the MMR, I managed to contract mumps. So while I was at university, obviously I'd had this surgery. I started university in February of 2006. And after that surgery, obviously I was on a liquid diet because my jaw had a pressure bandage on it. And because of the surgery I had, it took a while to heal. So I was on a liquid diet for a long, for a fair few months. So when I'd eventually got the energy to go to start university, it was in February. So I deferred for six months due to the health reason. When I got there, I loved university. It was hectic. It was hard work, but I came out with my degree and I'm so proud of myself for doing it despite the fact that I was very sick and fatigued throughout the second year, but this is due to an unfortunate situation in one of the houses where I was exposed to, exposed to mould, and I thus developed asthma and serious chest infections. Now, the chest infections could last three, four months each go. Sometimes they ran one into another. It was almost constant. If I got a cold, if I got sick, it went straight onto my chest, and it lasted forever. As you can hear by my voice being a bit croaky, I'm just recovering from just recovering from a viral infection and it did go slightly onto my chest, but I was really lucky this time I didn't need antibiotics. But yeah, so constant chest infections at university. I lost a lot, a lot of weight as well while I was there. I went down to seven stone and no one can explain why because I've always had a very good appetite. I eat lots and lots of no matter what food it is, I will eat a lot of it. So my diet was never a problem. It was very healthy, despite the fact I was at university. And as everyone knows, students' lives are fairly unhealthy, but no, mine was pretty good. But I was very active. I did rowing. I did football. I was a member of St. John Ambulance. Sometimes I did dance classes. But I also had my full-time university course and a weekend job at the same time in the student union pub. And then when I ended up being on placement, I ended up hurting my knees which have always been a weak point anyway by working five days a week at a hospital where I had to get up at six o'clock in the morning to commute for two hours to be able to start work at nine and then it was the same commute coming back I had to get three trains and a walk so it was a bit difficult at times but I persevered for three months after two months I had to quit my job at this student union which was gutting because I absolutely loved it but I was coming to the end of the year as well, so it was more of a necessity. But 
finally finished my placement plus with flying colours. Like I said, the lack of immunity to rubella did cost me one day of placement when I first started uni, but they decided that it, the risk was so low that I could still carry on with the course. Thankfully, because that course changed my life, it was brilliant. And I had some very rewarding jobs afterwards. But like I said, chest infections, a lot of sickness and a lot of other issues as well, this weight loss. Now, over the years, my asthma developed and I ended up discovering that I had asthma. At first, we didn't know what it was. So I ended up going to a chest clinic and they found it was asthma. They couldn't explain the weight loss, so they sent me to get piles of blood tests for every kind of thyroid problem, blood problem that you can imagine. I went to see a gastroenterologist, had a gastroscopy done to try and figure out if it was something in my gut. At the time, nothing came up. So I ended up being referred to an immunologist at an allergy and immunology clinic. And from there, they ran further blood tests, more specific ones. And they found that my white blood cells, IgGs, IgMs, IgAs, and also a fourth class is IgEs. So four subclasses. And pretty much my levels when I first had my blood taken there were non-existent. So based on this results, I ended up getting my diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency, which would also explain all the chest infections as my immune system was so depleted over the years that it just couldn't handle it anymore. And that's why infections lasted for so long and were so severe because I, my body wasn't able to fight it off, even with the usual antibiotics and other care routines that everyone else uses. So that came as a big relief because we just didn't know what was going on. This was our literal, our last resort. We were desperate to know what was happening. When I finally got a diagnosis, then it just took a weight off our shoulders. Mine, my parents, my family, everyone, we finally had an answer. And it was such a relief to get it. And then from then on, I got put on three weekly intravenous therapies with the white blood cell infusion so every three weeks I went to the hospital I had an IV stuck in my arm and I could wait there for an hour and a half two hours while I slowly infused my white blood cells now that was 200 mils every three weeks and it wasn't always smooth sailing all the way through believe me I had problems I had issues I had side effects when I had it I used to get terrible headaches I had almost an allergic reaction to it, which is quite common because your body kind of thinks, whoa, what are you doing putting this into me? This this shouldn't be here. I don't like it. I'm going to tell you that I don't like it. So eventually we found a pre-medication routine that worked, which was a couple of paracetamols for the headaches and an antihistamine. So I took that about an hour before I infused, put my emla cream on with the cling film and yeah i started that from the very beginning i tried a patch once for it and it didn't work so and i found intravenous i still have to do it today for blood tests because i really struggle if i don't have the time i tense up i find it extremely painful for the entirety of the length that that needle is in my veins and that still lasts to this day i'm not as bad now i did have to overcome a needle phobia to be able to do this up now the subcutaneous but I still can't watch anyone putting a IV needle in my arm that still freaks me out completely I cannot handle that so I have to have someone there to distract me these ones fine no needle phobia for this kind of infusion now which is a good job because I end up doing it myself every week and it's been a lot easier so years passed and in the process of tracking me throughout these infusions that's when I discovered I had celiac, which the immunologist diagnosed through symptoms, which explains in the My Illnesses and Me video that I have linked below that I did two weeks ago. So, like I said, the intravenous was going fine for years. I used to get a day off at work because it land, used to land on a Friday morning, so I would be at work. And this having this diagnosis actually enabled me to go back to full-time employment when I was off sick for months before that on sickness benefits because I physically couldn't work. I had fatigue. I was exhausted constantly. I had no energy. I could barely even shower by myself. It used to knock me out for hours. 
so yeah I was really 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 sick before I started the infusions but gradually I got my energy back I got back into full-time employment I got into a job that I absolutely love which I'm still in today albeit in a slightly different manner at the moment but going back to full-time soon but yeah so for four years everything was fine and then all of a sudden gradually in the last six months that I did it gradually the headaches came back they came back worse and eventually they turned into migraines now if you can imagine in my other video I described what these were like but they used to be ten times worse I used to be literally in a fetal position in a chair with one hand wrapped around my head one hand stuck straight out so I didn't bend the IV needle just so we could finish it off quickly and twice they had to stop the infusion the last two times once they managed to carry on the infusion but then I was just wiped for the day which was something that was getting more and more apparent was on the day of doing it and sometimes the day after I was wiped my fatigue levels were through the roof I had literally no energy I couldn't look after myself most of the time I had to have my stay at my mum's or my mum had to come and check up on me the day after I came home I literally crashed in bed I had a flask of drink next to me I barely ate I just couldn't function on that day and sometimes the day after even though I did have to get up to work eventually that did have to be changed as this got worse so the two times that they had to stop the IV early was the last time I used the original treatment I was on and I got halfway through and the migraine was so bad that they had to call the main immunologist in and prepare an injection and to say that after that I functioned like a normal person most people would be on the floor they'd be just dizzy sick nauseous I was fine which shows you the level of pain that I was in with that migraine they decided after that to change brand so the next time I had my fusion I had a different brand the same thing happened again but quicker I got a quarter of an infusion and they had to stop it and give me intravenous steroids this time so pretty messed up so eventually that's when we decided that this wasn't going to work and I had to switch to the subcutaneous infusion which is what you're seeing me complete tonight now one thing about this treatment is it is extremely expensive to create and for example the bottle of 200 ml that I used to receive and an intravenous just for the bottle alone is 600 pounds worth of treatment in one go that's 600 pounds just for one bottle and every three weeks you can imagine that adds up luckily over here in the UK I get it on the NHS I get it for free I don't have to pay but I do have to pay for my prescriptions but luckily I have a method of claiming back the money for that which I am so thankful for through work I don't know what I do without having that lifeline to be able to claim back some costs from the therapies that I have to go through and the cost that I incur it's just crazy but it works so it's well worth it but for the way they get the immunoglobins out part of it is through blood donations so if you can donate blood please do so it is literally your lifeline and if it's even possible to go one step further and donate your plasma it takes 10,000 donations to just make one bottle of usable white in immunoglobulin therapy it's crazy how expensive and how much we need to just make one bottle of this treatment so please anyone who can donate blood donate plasma especially please go out and do it you do not understand how much of a lifeline it is for people who have blood blood based conditions who need the white blood cells the placement platelets the plasma the white blood cells there's so many different ways you can help someone just by donating blood so now the subcutaneous infusion is just under the skin and it's a different brand again this one's high I use Hyzentra and like I said it's 30 mils once a week and it has worked so well I don't have the headaches I don't have the fatigue I can go to work or I can be up and out of the door in the morning if I need to do anything it does take a bit of time in the evenings to get it sorted and I have to take my infusions kit everywhere now but that's just part and parcel of having this immune deficiency
The fatigue levels are still there, but like I said in my other video, I have recently been diagnosed with other autoimmune disorders which have become come up as a result of this. For example, a fibromyalgia and the celiac. They are both autoimmune disorders and unfortunately it's one of the things that you can get while on this immune deficiency treatment is you can develop autoimmune disorders. So it's something I was aware of. I just didn't realise it would happen this quickly. But I now can cope with it. I'm on a treatment regime which I've explained in the other video. So yeah, that is pretty much my experience of the common variable immunodeficiency and what I've experienced throughout it. It's very rare disease. So yeah, and now we're getting to the end of the first 10 mils. So I shall now go through how I change my syringe part over and how much I put in out of that one and then preparing the next syringe. So here we go with that one. As you can see, I'm just filtering in the last couple of bits. And while I'm doing that, I shall just re-prepare this syringe here. I'll let you, while I'm preparing this part, just admire the stripy socks that I have on today. I love my stripy socks. I have a various range of colours, and especially knee highs, I love them. So as you can see, I'm just tapping it to remove the air bubbles. You can see there are a few in there. So you just tap it to go up, twist off the top. Squeeze out the air bubbles and like I say, you lose an neg absolutely neg negligible amount. So, bob that back on there. Now the air bubbles are out of it. Finish my last part of the squeezing in. There we go. And move that out of the way so you can see. You just take this white section here. Sometimes with these it's really difficult to twist them off. Like I said, you just twist, move that to one side. Take the needle off that one, twist it on there. See the small levels just there. That's perfectly normal. They won't do anything. So now I'm putting another five mils out of this syringe. So I'll go down to there. So another half syringe. So yeah, so that's how we found out that I had the immune deficiency. And obviously my treatment you can see going in. And like I said, this is every week. And I alternate sites and it doesn't really um, affect me apart from what you'll see in a moment I call my infusion berries. But you'll see what I mean by that shortly when I finish this infusion. Remove the needle and start on the next one. So yeah, while I'm doing that, I generally go back to the other syringe and bring up the rest of the liquid as I'm infusing this one in. So I shall do that now and you can... Have another look at how I do it. So you take your syringe again, pull it out to five mils. You have to pulling out ten mils. You put five mils of air in. Always the basic rule. Then you pop off the topper, put that to one side, take the protective sheath off again, squeeze another mil into your leg, bob that in, because that helps to draw out the liquid, so squeeze in the air, turn it over and then take the liquid out. Again keep the needle as close to the bottom as you can. As you can see it does. You do get some air bubbles. So just push them back in and move it to the bottom. And pull it all out again. Sometimes you have to do it and adjust the needle placing. There we go. And there you go. 10 mils out of there, into there. So now resheath the needle as always. Then leave that to settle while you finish this part of the infusion. So yes, so as I was saying, this is my main chronic illness it's the one that affects my life the most apart from the fibromyalgia just it can be sometimes an absolute pain in the backside when you're really tired or you've had such a busy day and the last thing you want to do is infuse but it is the most important part of my medical regime is this infusion I can't do anything if I don't do this I will get sick 
for example, when I swapped from the intravenous to the subcutaneous, I ended up getting a chest infection followed by a urinary tract infection and ended up being on two rolls of antibiotics because one just wasn't killing the other. So that was really uncomfortable and I did a training session at the hospital with my mum and one of the nurses. They gave me a DVD to watch which is available for anyone to have a look at online but hopefully this will show you quite a bit of what you need to do as well. I did that, well, originally it was the nurse that did it for me. They showed me what to do and then I just went from there. I did an extra session the week after, purely for my own benefit, in case I had any questions, which I did have a couple. So I'm glad I did do it. And then I got the hospital arranged with the pharmacy that they sent all my details over, got me ready. Every three months the pharmacy gives me a call, asks what I need, and I have a big box where I store it all. And when my sharps bin gets full, they will take it away and they will bring a replacement at the same time. So it's really easy to organise around um, where it can be delivered, whether I'm going to be in or not, or if not, if it can be delivered to my mum's. There's always an alternative address and someone that can sign for it. I get my equipment delivered every three months. And then the first thing I do is get it out of the box and transfer it to my big box of goodies which I then separate it into um, packs which contain all the equipment for one infusion and then I keep the Ziploc bag separate just in case I need to use them for anything else. So it's really handy because you always have a very good supply of Ziploc bags for when you go through airport security and you get them delivered to your home in a very handy manner. The drivers are always lovely. You get two boxes, one massive one for the infusion kit and a smaller one. And you also get gain a copious amount of bubble wrap as well. You have blood tests every three to six months, give or take, just to check your levels to make sure they're at the right number. If you need to increase the dosage, do that. If you put on weight, whether that's going to mean you need to increase the dosage as well. Because like I said, I was 6 stone 12 when I first started these infusions. I'm now pretty much at or around 9 stone now, so between 8, 12 and 9, 2. So for me, that is absolutely amazing. But that also happened because my body wasn't using the calories to fight off infection. It was using them for what it should do, keeping me healthy. So I managed to put the weight back on. Plus living now a gluten-free diet is really helping with that as well. But yeah, so... They do a couple of training sessions with you and then they pretty much leave you to it. All I can say is the improvement since I got on a proper treatment regime for all my illnesses and doing this subcutaneous, it's been a complete life changer. It's so much more freeing. I don't have to arrange stuff around appointments. I can just take the kit with me in my box wherever I go. My friends, my family have kind of got used to the idea of it happening now. But really they didn't have a choice in the matter. If I'm there and it's Friday, I'll needle. This this is a day-to-day -day life. It has to be done. There is no putting it off. Sometimes if I've got something on in the evening, I'll do it earlier on in the day. But normally I do it just before I go to bed so I can literally pyjamas on, brush my teeth, crash. And when I'm infusing, I normally have a little bit of picnic, for example, a cup of flask of tea, a smoothie, something to eat. So I always have and I normally either put a film on or watch something on YouTube. If I'm in the living room, I'll put a film on the telly, just because it gets boring when it lasts for so long. Or sometimes I just read. Depends how I feel at the time. Today, while I infused, I thought, why not? I'm going to make this video, take the time. So yeah, today it's going in pretty, fingers crossed, pretty nicely so far, so keep going. It's getting sore now, but that's because I'm pushing 30 mils of fluid into an area of my leg that doesn't normally have that amount of fluid so I'll show you what I mean afterwards when you see my bubble so yeah the area can be a bit tender afterwards which is why I prefer to do it late at night if I can then I can just literally go to bed go to sleep and forget about it till morning when normally it's gone down and it's absolutely fine it can sting while the actual white blood cells are going in this area can be sore just the usual things when you have dressings and needles in flesh for a while it can get very sore so always prepare to have painkillers on hand just in case afterwards that your leg's really sore. 
Now, unfortunately, I can't take ibuprofen because that brings me out in everything. So I literally have hot water bottles and paracetamol to keep me going, as well as my antispasm meds. So yeah, that is pretty much the story of my infusions. But now it's time to change sites, so it's time to de-needle. So I'll show you what that involves next. So the first thing, like I said, I have done now another 5 mils. That's the end for this site. So I'm now going to get a piece of transport tape. You'll need, I normally need another longish one. And have the cotton wool ball to hand as well. So the first thing you do is take off the transport. I would also advise if you are going to do this and you are a you have a certain amount of hair on if you're a man hair, hair on your legs or hair on your stomach I would advise shaving where you're going to have the transport because it can be as you can see rather sticky and you really do not want to be ripping out your hair at the same time which is what used to happen to me every time I had an IV my arms have got a fair amount of fluff on them and it made it rather uncomfortable so when you've taken off all the transport again needle phobes look away now and you bob your cotton wool on sorry my camera died at that bit I'll show you better later bob the needle somewhere where you can reattach safely the plastic sleeve you had earlier Pop that over the edge of there, bob that over to one side and secure with the length of transport. If you haven't made it long enough, then you can always bob a second bit down. Now, you'll be able to see here, there is a slight discoloration and there is a raised bump on my leg. It, will, it feels different to the rest of my leg. No, you'll be able to see better when I've got the plasters on. But, yeah get a area of discoloration just around there right and now it's time to unveil the next area now as you can see we repeat the process like we did before get the steri strip out of its cover and give it a good wipe over rip off your pieces of transport so what you need to do now is just prepare your syringe as you did before. Tap it to get all the air balls up. Twist off the needle. Push up the air bubbles out of it. A little bit like that. Bob this needle to one side this time. And attach it straight onto your other tubing. So you take off this cap on the end. And twist it onto there like so. Bob that over to one side. Again you will need to prime the tubing so you just squeeze slightly as you can see. Again don't worry about the small air bubbles that's perfectly fine. Then you just do it until you get a tiny bit of liquid at the tip there. So now you've sterilized the area, you've prepped that. You then do the alcohol gel on your hands as you can see wipe that all over just to re-sterilize them get the slightly raised bumpy edge of that as you can see so you unsheath your needle bob that safely to one side again needle foes please look away pinch an inch and go always like i said before at a 45 degree angle so you take your long piece of transport like i said before it's very wise to do the hair removal before you do this that's what it looks like then you pull back on the syringe as you can see the bubbles go back no blood you'd know if you had some i've had that before where i've got blood in the line and you can really tell if you've done something bad 
if you have blood in a line it just means that you've hit one of the small blood cells at the top and that you will need to detach take the needle out reattach some fresh tubing and a fresh needle and then bob it back in again and then just go from there repeat the procedure so yeah now another 15 mils to go so yes as i was saying it can sting like this one does but never mind uncomfortably stingy but i can deal with that that i am completely used to now there is a chance tomorrow this will wipe me out a bit because i might still have infection and it will um kick its butt hopefully and we'll get rid of this for good it will give me a bit more energy because my fatigue has been horrendous this week because of it and yeah it's not fun when you have complete and utter fatigue slams and you just have to drag yourself around and really you struggle but you just try not to show it while you're putting in this last bit of the infusion it's always worth just putting anything that you can into the sharps bin next to you so for example now you'll bob get the bottle there bob it in these two long needles which you're not going to use again into the sharps bin now don't throw that one away yet because you've still got your five mils other mils to put in so you wait and then also i dispose of the plasters in there at the same time so yeah um the only bit i'll show you when it's finished is when i remove the needles and finishing off the plan so another thing that is really important when you do have um, any kind of chronic illness or immune deficiency is being honest with the people around you about how you feel how it's going to affect you because you never know you might be out somewhere with them and they might be the only person you can rely on to actually help you with something and if people don't understand then that's fair enough as well it's quite a big thing to accept is accepting it yourself and other people accepting it so it always helps to know that there's other people out there with the same condition you're not on your own there are so many online support groups out there and charities that deal with it if you are based in the uk then you have uk pips you also have in the usa the immune deficiency foundation i will link them both below so you can go have a look at their website if you want any more information and there's so many Facebook groups, blogs, Tumblr posts, Instagrams, Facebook. There's so much online information out there and support groups out there. Don't feel scared to go and access those. I'm a member of at least 10 different ones and you get so much information, so much support, some advice, other people's experiences because you never know what is going to be something that you might need to know about it's so important not just to have friends offline like in your real life your friends your family to know but sometimes they might need support so they might find it useful to access these groups as well i know i have and i know a lot of people who are on the support groups find a lot of solace a lot of support a lot of help and sometimes it's wonderful to meet people so if you're ever around and i'm going to be doing something feel free to say hi have a chat if you want to meet up and to have someone to talk to then everyone needs that in real life as well as online so don't be afraid to contact those online support groups you never know it could be the lifeline that you've been looking for so i will link a few of the facebook groups that i'm um a member of below they are mainly closed in private groups so you will have to explain like why if you they generally accept people who have an immune deficiency who have something along the same lines or family members or parents who have children there's also support groups out there for young people for adults for children there's all sorts of resources out there i will link what i know and what i have down below but there's always more so if you know of something that i don't please feel free to let me know down below as well support groups are so important be they in person face to face online 
it doesn't matter the support is there it's good for anyone to have that it's an essential everyone needs support everyone needs a network of friends family and sometimes strangers that you can just open up to because they're in the same situation so yeah if you want to have a look into any of those or any questions about that as well just leave them in the comments below and again here we are swapping over the tubes just so you can get a better look this time so they just twist off and you get the other one you can leave that just to the side for a moment take that one back off and reattach this syringe with the last five mils straight into there and like I said don't worry about the air bubbles they're tiny even though they look huge they're actually really tiny so here we are on the last of the infusion the last five mils and this is what i was talking about about the raised infusion lumps you can see it looks like a strawberry and so i call them my infusion strawberries and that pretty much happens every time on that this one it doesn't go down as far as deep into the subcutaneous level so yeah that's what I mean by an infusion strawberry. When you've done that, you take these two again, attach the empty one to the empty syringe, like that, and then bob it into the shouts box. And now it's time to take out the final needle and bob the plaster on and take the cling film off my leg. Got my little cotton wool pad. And that's why you need the cotton wool. So as always, put the little sheath back on your needle. That goes straight into the bin after you've secured this with some transport. Now, as you can see, that's the one I've just finished. That's the one from earlier. Can tell you but by the morning that'll have gone so yeah that now goes into the infusion box and the time is recorded when it's finished which it is. as you can see fill it all in done and now we're 25 minutes not actually that bad Obviously, I haven't shown you some of it because it was just me shoving the liquid in and that's not very interesting. But yeah, so all done. Now it's time for bed, sleep, because I'm really tired now. So yeah, infusion done and a success. The last bit I'll show you is obviously the disposal of the cotton wool pads. But obviously you've got your cotton wool pad there so what you need to do is get one of these plasters open that up so you get it ready take the little paper bits off bob those to one side take one side of the plaster sorry the transport bob on your little plaster take that off i normally fold it up so it doesn't take as much room Take that, bob it into there, and then repeat on the other one. Then the last bit you need to do is get your infusion box ready for next week so you don't have to rush around the week after. So this is my storage box. Quite a large one. So yeah, open it up. So you get one of the new packs out. As you can see, I've got all them all ready and then see on the side I've got spare supplies in the bottom so you just refill those when you get your next refill you close it up and then when you've done your other plaster take that bob it in the box and you're finished and now final bits take the paper off the plaster bob your plaster on your bobble this one in your shelf bin take all the rest of the equipment and the shelf bin back to its storage areas so yeah final last bit of organization you take the final file shelf box 
close that up store it open up your box again pop in your infusion kit your antibacterial gel your emla cream transport tape paperwork tray then dispose of everything else like i said if you've got any questions then write them in the comments below and i will do my best to answer them if you're interested in knowing a bit more about my gluten-free diet then leave a comment down below if you have any questions about cvid the process or anything like that just write it in the comments below and i will do my best to answer it if not i will do my best to um, link somewhere that you can find the information you want or if you want to see any more videos like this about my other illnesses that are a bit more in depth then again write in the comments below don't forget to like the video if you thought it was interesting if you've learned something give me a bit of feedback did you know about this before um do you know anyone else who has it do you have it yourself and if so um let me know what you do how you manage it and what kind of ways you use it and you store your supplies i'm always intrigued on finding out new ways of storing things and new things that are available so yeah like the video if you thought it was interesting if you like the content if you want to see more subscribe to my channel if you want to see more about the day-to-day -day life of well my day-to-day -day life what i get up to what adventures i go on it's not always waffling like this about illnesses but on occasion there is something i need to waffle about so be prepared there may be waffles um like subscribe share the video if you think it could help anyone else then share it get the word out about cvid immune deficiencies and all of that because you never know you might someone might not be as confident as i am in sharing this information so yeah if anyone wants any information about chronic illness then let me know and if i can i shall try and do other videos on the subjects if there's any other sub videos you'd like me to do then just tell me in the comments let me know what you'd like to see in the future i'm always up for thinking about new ideas so yeah let me know so yeah that is pretty much everything i think i have to say if i think of anything else i'll make a further video on it if there's any more information you want comment below like subscribe and i'll see you in my next video bye